I mean, don't just dismiss that, okay, there is release of cytokines which are contributing to ventilation perfusion imbalance. That is understandable. You have to understand why is it that these patients are also having CNS manifestation. So I want you to understand or listen to my next points very, very carefully. Hey guys, welcome back. The topic we're going to study today is fat embolism syndrome. In fact, there are two terms that you will encounter. One is going to be fat embolism. Second is fat embolism syndrome. So with majority of orthopedic procedures, especially the ones which are related to nailing in the bone, there can be fat embolism. But the inbuilt systems of the body is going to prevent the development of fat embolism syndrome in the patient. Now let us look at what actually happens in fat embolism syndrome. Subsequent to polytrauma, like this person had a fracture of the shaft of the femur, fat globules will be released in the circulation. These fat globules are then going to cause release of free fatty acids that will damage the alveolar endothelium. Therefore, there would be alveolar edema, there would be damage to the brain capillary. So there is going to be stupor and coma. And most importantly, we also have development of petechia in these patients, which are predominantly seen around in the axilla and the chest area. In fact, what I've described before you at the moment are the three important GERD Wilson criteria which are useful for di diagnosis of this particular condition. Subsequently, I will explain the minor criteria to you as well. So let us discuss this as a case-based scenario. Let us uh, assume this is an 18-year-old guy and uh, he was given a Harley Davidson or a Bullet or any other heavy-duty bike by his father on his 18th birthday and unfortunately he had a biking accident. Now, luckily, he was using a helmet at that particular point of time, so he did not sustain any head injury. But uh, because the bike fell on the leg of this guy, so there has been fracture of the shaft of the femur, which is going to cause release of fat globules into the circulation. This guy was rushed to the nearest hospital where the best orthopedician of the city operated upon this guy. So surgical intervention for the fracture of shaft of femur, it was, I would say, maybe a fracture that had uh, even caused uh, extensive damage to the soft tissue and maybe the part of the bone was jutting out. But this guy has been operated upon. He has been taken well care of. Unfortunately, post-operatively, approximately about 12 to 72 hours later. And uh, why I'm calling it unfortunate is because if fat embolism occurs, it becomes very difficult to explain to the relatives why there is a sudden deterioration because they're obviously not technical people. They don't understand what uh, uh, fat globules or free fatty acids or what's going to be the damage to the endothelium or the vital organs going to be. So post-operatively, what we are noticing is this guy is having sudden onset breathlessness and uh, well the nurse noticed that uh, this person was breathless so she has started this person on high flow oxygen and uh, gave a call to the orthopedician who had operated upon this person let me say yesterday but the orthopedician said well i'm a little busy in the ot so let me finish a case and i will come but uh, if the orthopedician takes a few hours to come and most of the time that's going to be the case because obviously he would not be free at all the times to attend to every case so by the time he finishes his case and comes it might be actually too late why because in this particular case the free fatty acids are going to damage the endothelium of the brain as well they can be cerebral edema manifestations so initially it's a possibility that this person may not be uh, recognizing his parents he may not be recognizing that you are a healthcare worker he might be uh, having uh, cognition defects uh, subsequently in fact these patients can go into coma and you might even have to intubate the patient now for the parents this is obviously going to be a big shock because initially this guy post operatively he spoke to his mom he said mom i had this accident i am fine please don't worry and now he's not able to recognize his mother and at the same point of time the nurse is putting him on oxygen and now he's not even opening his eyes and he's not even recognizing anybody so the point is when there's a sudden deterioration obviously the relatives will go into a panic mode and they will obviously contribute to problems problems for you as well not only from the perspective that they might be rude to you but even you would be wondering what really suddenly happened if you carefully examine this patient you will notice that there will be also presence of petechiae these petechiae are usually noticed fairly late because see post operatively because the patient's upper part of the body may not be exposed by you for the entire physical examination because you don't want to cause any discomfort to the patient so you may not actually examine the axillary area of the patient but subsequently these petechiae will spread all over including over the chest in the front back and even on the extremities as well 
well as i said what i'm describing before you are technically called as gerd wilson criteria for diagnosis of uh, fat embolism syndrome and while describing these i also want to say that you must be very very careful while attempting the mcq because one of the important differential diagnosis of this condition is pulmonary thromboembolism you see if i gave you a case scenario where a patient has been immobilized like this particular chap he was let me say not driving a bike but uh, he was crossing the road when a car hit him and he unfortunately fractured his uh, tibia or maybe both the tibia now he cannot walk any patient who is immobilized like a case of bilateral tibial fracture or it could be even a, a lady who's recently given a delivery or has had a baby post a cesarean section so my message is any patient having prolonged immobilization for 2 to 3 days complete bed ridden there could be development of clots in the soleal veins and these clots on the soleal veins can then embolize from the primary side via the inferior vena cava to the right side of the heart and then into the pulmonary circulation contributing to pulmonary thromboembolism the message is pulmonary thromboembolism will also present with respiratory distress but there will be no cns manifestations in these patients i mean you are not going to have a development of a fast onset coma in a patient of pulmonary thromboembolism yes hypoxia can contribute to a bit of drowsiness uh, or initially the patient might be even having aggressive behavior because hypoxia initially makes a person angry but you will not have coma you will not have ptk so uh, you must always consider this in the differential diagnosis uh, before you comment on the diagnosis of fat embolism syndrome so i mean every time you read a question related to trauma and there's a respiratory distress you obviously have to think not only in terms of fat embolism but even in terms of uh, uh, pulmonary thromboembolism and one more differential in fact i can mention right at the moment i mean traditionally i describe a differential when i'm completed a topic but here what i'm saying is because in the exam he is going to ask you to make a diagnosis on a clinical grounds so uh, there can also be pulmonary contusion written in multiple choice question now pulmonary contusion will also occur after trauma but most of the time the respiratory distress of pulmonary contusion develops as early as 6 hours when i was describing fat embolism i was giving you a relatively longish time frame something in the middle something like 24 hours i would say from a range of 12 to 72 but in pulmonary contusion respiratory distress is relatively early and when you do a x ray in a patient of pulmonary contusion you will notice that there would be localized i mean whichever lobe of the lung is the one which is traumatized you would be having localized ground glass opacities in contrast when it comes to pulmonary thromboembolism i've described about radiological findings like hampton's hump which would be very characteristic and would be easily identifiable or you can do a ct angiography in a patient and you would be able to see a big saddle embolus which is obstructing the pulmonary artery it is bifurcation contributing to hypoxia contributing to ventilation perfusion mismatch in the patient so once we are clear about these two differential diagnoses which have to be kept in mind and i want to highlight once again it is not the duration that matters it is the antecedental and the concomitant information that is given in the question uh, let's have a quick look at what really happened in this case though i have shown you an animation in this case which is a new addition in our this uh, i would say the pl 4.0 addition and our objective has been to you know in, in, introduce the visual memory component or rather enhance the visual memory component of your brain so this is what i said ultimately fat globules have been released you can take this as a representation of the shaft of the femur this is going to be acted upon by lpl lipoprotein lipase which is going to contribute to generation of free fatty acids the bad guys here are free fatty acids because they are the ones which will be damaging the capillaries which are surrounding the alveoli as a result of the damage to the pulmonary endothelium two things will happen and listen to these words very carefully i am not saying that there is any increase of hydrostatic pressure in the pulmonary vessels which will cause leakage of fluid i am saying there is a physical damage to the pulmonary endothelium so there is going to be leakage of fluid out of these blood vessels into the alveoli there is going to be ultimately a alveolar edema occurring and along with this alveolar edema we also find alveolar hemorrhage because after all the blood vessels are damaged so there would be bloody fluid present so alveolar edema and alveolar hemorrhage will explain why are these patients going to have development of respiratory distress the spo to the patient is falling and you know initially any hypoxic patient will be angry and he'll say do something doctor i'm not getting breath but gradually as the oxygen levels will fall you will notice that the person's uh, ability to recognize his vision component everything would be compromised 
So ultimately what's happening is that free fatty acids and the damage to the pulmonary endothelium will cause a release of cytokines and now we reach an important part of our discussion. I mean don't just dismiss that okay there is release of cytokines which are contributing to ventilation perfusion imbalance that is understandable. You have to understand why is it that these patients are also having CNS manifestation so I want you to understand or listen to my next points very very carefully. I want to tell you that approximately 20 to 30 percent, mark my words there, I'm not saying 20 to 30 percent of the world population. I'm saying 20 to 30 percent of those cases who are having fatabolism syndrome are having CNS manifestations. So the query of most of the doctors is that, sir, after all the cytokines and, and the free fatty acid, they're damaging the lung endothelium. So how do they end up on the left side of the heart so that from the left side they will go into systemic circulation? I mean, are you telling us that the fat globules can traverse by the capillaries and come to the left side of the heart uh, well that is obviously a possibility but most importantly they have demonstrated that in 20 to 30 percent cases of fat embolism syndrome the patient might be having a patent fossa valis if there's a patent fossa valis present the incidence of cns manifestations is approximately 20 to 30 percent of the total cases uh, and they these patients have been documented on trans esophageal echo to have a patent fossa valis because of which there can be the passage of fat globules directly into the left side of the heart and once they go into the left side of the heart then they will obviously be thrown into the systemic circulation and once they go into systemic circulation that is when the brain will also be involved and the uh, the capillaries of the brain will also be affected so i want to highlight these fact facts that in approximately 20 to 30 percent cases not of the entire population of the world there is a pfo but in cases who have developed fat embolism pfo has been documented on TEE. Therefore, cerebral circulation will be affected. You will initially have uh, cognition issues, stupor, and then subsequently a uh, development of coma for which the person will definitely require intubation. Why intubation? Because uh, I can say like this that any person who cannot uh, uh, maintain his airway, there is a high risk of aspiration pneumonia developing in this patient. So CNS manifestations will start occurring. Uh, as I mentioned, even in the starting of the discussion, I said if a patient is undergoing any kind of orthopedic procedure, like if a patient is undergoing a intramedullary nailing, even then fat embolism can occur, no issues with that. But somehow the critical mass of fat globules, the critical mass of lipoprotein lipase contributing to free fatty acids is not generated to trigger all the manifestations that I'm saying. So a large number of, uh, I would say, cases will definitely be present but they never come to clinical limelight or they never come to clinical attention so i've written asymptomatic fat embolism syndrome can also be present i mean this looks like a very surprising term asymptomatic on one hand and gross manifestations where the patient's relatives are ready to you know fight with you so very two diametrically opposite things that i've said but both are a possibility you need a critical mass of cytokines being produced critical mass of free fatty acids being generated so that the manifestations will occur the usual cause as i highlighted in the initial part is going to be polytrauma so we not only find that it is fracture of the long bones but even the pelvic fracture which is uh, usually seen in road traffic accidents can contribute to this manifestation apart from the hemorrhage component that it can uh, be associated with Another important cause to be remembered, though I mean I will say that majority of MCQs will describe trauma, even pancreatitis has to be kept in mind, then is diabetes mellitus. Very surprising, I mean a lot of guys, you know, they message me and say, sir, how did you say diabetes mellitus contributes to fat embolism syndrome? So I just want to say that in people who are having diabetes mellitus, anyway triglycerides are very high. So when triglycerides are very high, lipid profile is grossly deranged. I mean triglycerides in diabetes can be shooting beyond 500 milligram percent. So this kind of a deranged lipid profile can not only contribute to diabetic patients developing acute pancreatitis. Listen to my words carefully. I said hypertriglyceridemia. Hypertriglyceridemia is an independent risk factor for acute pancreatitis. Hypertriglyceridemia is also a documented risk factor for a person having fat embolism manifestations even without trauma. Without trauma, that's the surprising thing. Then post joint reconstruction surgery, I mean orthopedic procedures nowadays you will notice that these are uh, computer navigation aided uh, but in spite of that you know joint reconstruction surgery will involve a bit of hammering, chiseling, you have to remove the old head of femur and deploy an implant. So because of all the drilling and the chiseling that is going on again fat embolism manifestations can occur. 
then you will notice a lot of people who are going in for uh, i would say cosmetic surgery liposuction i'm not talking about bariatric surgery which is a definitive method of losing weight liposuction just to you know get rid of the belly part belly that a person is having because the bmi is on the higher side and person wants to look relatively better so tummy tuck is the casual word that people might be using for this liposuction and remove the centripetal obesity component then this liposuction again when they sign the consent form it is written that fat embolism can occur if a patient is very sick for example if a patient is having total parental nutrition being received for uh, since he had extensive burns or he had a massive gi surgery then even parental nutrition you are giving fats into the body so some component of that can definitely contribute to free fatty acid generation and again the cytokine production can occur uh, the next part is actually not seen by we civilian doctors but is seen by doctors who are in the navy that is decompression sickness in decompression sickness when a diver is coming up from you see when he is like 100 meters below the sea level they are instructed to gradually come up if a diver gets panicky suddenly he spotted a shark and a diver you know he is he's a maybe a rookie a new one to the job and he got very panicky so when he will try to come up very fast not only there's going to be precipitation of nitrogen bubbles which will contribute to cerebral hypoxia which will cause blockage of the coronary circulation causing chest pain but apart from nitrogen bubbles causing blockage physical of important organs of the body you could also be having fat embolism that is occurring so alternative name for decompression sickness as you know from your physiology books is kaisen's disease i want to repeat this fact once again traditionally with decompression sickness you read about nitrogen bubbles contributing to physical blockage of the a coronary circulation or let me say the kidney circulation so obviously patient can have abdominal pain flank pain chest pain but along with this even fat embolism have been documented so what i have done here is just described causes of fat embolism to you and you will again notice that traditionally when i describe a topic i start with causes then with clinical manifestation but this particular topic you see the question when it will be given to you the framing of the question will be given in a fashion that he wants you to get diverted and start thinking in terms of terms like pulmonary thromboembolism and pulmonary contusion so you have to keep that in focus and obviously if he mentions any of these terms initially he says patient underwent a liposuction patient underwent a post uh, joint reconstruction surgery uh, i wrote the word injury here to initially highlight the fact that during joint reconstruction surgery even if it is robotic even it is computer uh, navigation aided still some injury can occur with the the hammering and the chiseling that is going on because you need to remove the old head of femur deploy in a new one so related to that that's why the injury word initially came up so if you are having any of this information that i have highlighted currently on the board i put the entire thing in the uh, domain of yours just to highlight that if any of these points are given anyway you will be more confident in answering as fat embolism syndrome in a patient uh, just to set the record straight i'll just give you some figures also they've documented the fact that even when it comes to polytrauma listen to my words again very carefully this time i'm not saying that a person is having any routine orthopedic procedure i am saying if a person is having polytrauma the incidence of fat embolism is as high as 90% shocking right but fat embolism syndrome incidence is approximately 2% this highlights the fact that what i was saying initially that human body has huge powers of healing itself every time something goes wrong in our body every time there are cytokines every time there is going to be uh, i would say free fatty acid generation and damage to the capillary endothelium the body will try to set things right so even if you have fat embolism that does not prove the fact that somebody will be having fat embolism syndrome and that is the reason why these criteria have been devised so that we are very very sure about our diagnosis and we can start treatment of our patient accordingly and if i mean you make a wrong diagnosis uh, it was pulmonary thrombosis thrombolysis you could have saved the patient by doing either a thromboembolectomy or going in for thrombolysis if it was pulmonary contusion the guy will end up in ARDS so you could have actually intubated the patient and put him on a ventilator protocol so that at least the chances of this patient expiring could have been minimized so my point is that if you deploy the criteria properly you will be able to make a more accurate diagnosis of your patient so let's have a look at the major and the minor criteria since the major ones i have already spoken about i'll write them subsequently but initially we will now begin by describing the minor criteria that you will notice 
on vital examination there will be a tachycardia the patient will also be febrile so this is supportive evidence that you will notice being given in the question then if you do a fundus examination a uh, important uh, part to be done for diagnosis of heart embolism syndrome uh, you will be able to see uh, retinal changes now what kind of retinal changes can be anticipated one would be the break in the column like you can see uh, the retinal circulation you can see the retinal arteries the fat globules will be physically blocking the retinal circulation that's one of the manifestations that can be present or in fact they could even be retinal petechiae repeat the fact once again either it could be that retinal artery per se is having a breach that is the fat globules are causing a physical blockage or by that matter of fact there could even be petechiae noticed on fundus examination of the patient then the fat globules will be affecting the kidney circulation as well as the liver microcirculation if the kidney circulation is affected this same patient you will notice uh, uh, the record of input output you will notice that the output of this patient is substantially reduced normal urine output should be 1 ml per kg per hour but for past few hours the urine output of this patient will be substantially reduced i mean anuria oliguria will be talking about entire 24 hours i am saying even if you look at the uh, output monitor or monitoring of this patient for the previous let me say 3 hours 4 hours since he had a onset of symptoms a drop in the urine output of the patient will be noticed the damage to the liver circulation will contribute to ictrus this finding may actually be missed because the patient was lying with his eyes closed so uh, in any comatose patient obviously eyes are closed so you might actually miss it so you just need to open the eye and you will notice the unmistakable yellow tint of the sclera which is present hematologically speaking there will be a sudden drop in the hemoglobin values of the patient what you compared with the initial report like you know you always do a complete blood count pre operatively so if you look at the cbc of this patient pre operatively and post operatively the hemoglobin is reduced so initially you are thinking this guy is having internal bleeding but simultaneously other features are also developing like the involvement of the kidney or the involvement of the liver there's a thrombocytopenia occurring and which explains the petechiae component and because it's a inflammatory state the esr of this patient will be very high i mean going up to 80s 90s even going up to 100 as well in fact fat is the main villain which is responsible for this problem so you could also be having fat globules present in this person's urine and sputum i said a big thing man i said fat macroglobinemia fat globules could actually be demonstrated i mean if you if you uh, send a urine specimen of this patient or a sputum specimen of this patient to your friendly pathologist they can deploy special stains like you know sudan black for fat so i mean they can deploy the special stains uh, to actually identify the fat globules and why is this a minor criteria i mean you, you your query would be sir if you if you consider that this is such a important finding then why did you mention that this is a minor criteria that is because fat globules in the urine you see fat globules in the urine can be written as oval fat bodies and you will read about me saying oval fat bodies in nephrotic syndrome i repeat the fact once again every time you will read the literature on nephrotic syndrome and nephrotic range proteinuria you will also read about oval fat bodies and fat macroglobinemia similarly kyluria filariasis there is again lymph and lymph would be you know having a digested fat so fat globules in the urine can be present even in kyluria even in a case of nephrotic syndrome which is the reason why i can highlight the fact that this would be a minor criteria the major ones we can summarize once again for practice though they have already been talked about the first and the foremost would be involvement of the lungs of the patient then can be central nervous system involvement and third i highlighted was the petechiae most of the time accessory muscles or respiration will already be in use by the time the orthopedician or you are a physician is attending to this case and along with this uh, the patient would have already gone into coma i also want to highlight that if he says what kind of respiratory failure is present in these patients then initially the person will be having type 1 respiratory failure why because he is hyperventilating but if you are not able to diagnose the case or if supportive treatment is not given to this person then there will be respiratory muscle fatigue respiratory muscle fatigue will trigger type 2 respiratory failure i repeat once again that's a standard norm with all cases in respiratory system covid 19 pneumonia when they come to you initially they are hyperventilating so type 1 respiratory failure if they are not getting a hospital bed like we had in uh, march april in india people dying in their cars 
because they could not secure a hospital bed that's that's going to be respiratory muscle fatigue and uh, that would be type 2 respiratory failure similarly in asthma acute asthma is type 1 status asthmaticus and impending respiratory failure i mean asthmatic has been breathing heavily since the whole night he could not secure a hospital bed so he goes into impending respiratory failure the chest is totally silent that's when you're going to be having development of type 2 respiratory failure so for diagnosis of heart embolism you need to have a high index of suspicion uh, it should be presence of uh, one major criteria remember my words very carefully one major criteria like a cns issue or uh, a lung issue or a thrombocytopenia along with four minor criteria and i also want to say that don't be too rigid while deploying this criteria like suppose in the patient at the moment only one major and three minor or two minor are satisfied you are not going to say that okay when all the four will appear that is when i am going to make a diagnosis and start treatment of the patient because by that time it might be too late so a patient who's let me say febrile and at the same time he is having a slightly decreased urine output along with the uh, uh, features uh, like uh, low hemoglobin low platelet count which which you know the laboratory reports are going to take some time to uh, come back to you so i'm i mean i mean i don't need to be rigid with this one you need to be sure obviously one major criteria has to be present but for four minors because some of them are laboratory criteria laboratories take their own sweet turnaround time you very well know technicians they may not be uh, for, following the deadlines that you offer them that okay I, I want an early report so you don't need to be ultra rigid in deploying this criteria treatment has to be started up and we will now talk about what is the minimalistic workup that must be done in this case if a patient is done a chest x-ray early in the part of the disease there will be absolutely no findings x-ray can be normal but in the subsequent part because there will be alveolar edema because there would be alveolar hemorrhage thanks to the injury to the alveolar uh, capillaries the the ones which are lining the alveoli per se are damaged and there is a leakage of fluid into the alveoli that's when diffuse infiltrates would be present that is why uh, nowadays they recommend going in for a ct chest a helical ct and once you do a, a helical CT chest of the patient, you might be able to notice uh, the same diffuse infiltrates that might be referred as ground glass opacities. Obviously, you know, uh, considering nowadays scenario, COVID-19 testing would be done in a patient, rapid testing can be done and the rapid testing would turn out to be negative. But then uh, ground glass opacities on a helical CT in the setting of trauma. I want to highlight the statement that I have said. Why? Because you see ground glass opacities in the lower parts of the lung, especially in current scenario, COVID-19 is anyway to be considered. The second thing that I would like to do in this patient after evaluating the chest of this patient, either with the chest x-ray or CT, whatever facilities are available is a CT head. CT head is anyway to be done because the CNS changes which are occurring in this patient should not be because of CNS hemorrhage. No, he could have actually fallen down from the bike and he had a subdural hematoma or a extradural hematoma which is subsequently expanding in size and now it is producing a mass effect. So when I did a CT scan of this particular chap, there was no evidence of any kind of CNS bleeding, no intraventricular, subdural, extradural, any kind of bleed was not present in this patient. If uh, you do a CT head in some cases, though in the later part of the illness, there might be a diffuse white matter petechiae. However, do not give too much of importance to the statement that I have said at the moment. In majority of cases, both the X-ray and the CT head would be normal. Transesophageal echocardiography facility may not be available in routine hospital. So I'm talking about ideal scenario because you need to demonstrate the presentation of uh, patent fossa ovalis which can explain the movement of the fat globules from the right side of the heart to the left side and then into the systemic circulation. Doppler must be done. Doppler anyway would be available. Why I want to do a Doppler is because I want to rule out deep vein thrombosis. So I'm talking about Doppler of the extremities. I have already explained to you that one of the important differentials of any chap who's immobilized after surgery, it could be orthopedic surgery, non-orthopedic surgery, is development of clot in the solial veins and embolization to the lungs. There's a separate lecture on pulmonary thrombobolism. Do listen to that. And when you listen to both the lectures, you will notice, uh, I mean, one after the other, you will notice the stark contrast that both manifestations uh, present as and therefore are easier for us to identify. Uh, then again uh, from the perspective of an institution, a research institution, let me say bronchoalveolar lavage can be done and this bronchoalveolar lavage can then be stained with uh, stained for fat. 
so uh, you might be actually in the exam from an ideal perspective being given of lung specimen like unfortunately the patient died and this would be a lung specimen which was stained with oil red o so you will be able to notice uh, uh, the presence of uh, i mean fat globules which were occluding the lung circulation primarily but investigation number 3 and investigation number 5 are mainly from i would say institutional perspective otherwise in clinical practice because we don't have all of these facilities it is the gerd wilson criteria as as i have highlighted which are primarily to be deployed and in gerd wilson criteria you will notice that none of these investigations were included you, you very well have seen that i have not included i mean i have not said that you must be doing a ct head in the patient i just said you need to demonstrate a coma but coma has so many reasons so if he says that you are able to deploy these criteria supportive evidence from the workup you are ready for treatment of this patient there is no definitive treatment for this condition what is the first step because there is a drop in the oxygen saturation there is respiratory distress so you can be using a non rebreather mask and you can be giving high flow oxygen to this patient at approximately 12 liters per minute the objective is a uh, damage control salvage whatever you can then iv fluids are anyway to be given to this patient why because uh, when the patient is breathing very fast respiratory rate is increased like when i'm talking to you i'm also breathing simultaneously there is loss of water from the body in the form of water vapor we all have insensible losses you very well know insensible losses can be in the form of sweating insensible loss can be in the form of water in the stool but one of the important insensible losses is the evaporation of water while we talk and while we breathe in this person since the respiratory rate is on the higher side so insensible losses are definitely increased so the textbook says that iv fluids should be given to this patient to manage the dehydration component you don't need to give too much of uh, uh, iv fluids because anyway there is a alveolar edema present in this patient but uh, at the same time he says do not leave the patient to high and dry in a sense that you are not taking care of the increased insensible losses in this patient then we will be giving steroids for to these patients now why do you give steroids to these patients is mainly because of the cns involvement you see whenever there is a development or damage to the vasculature of the brain the microvasculature of the brain there is a cerebral edema so i want to reduce the vasogenic i'm not talking about cytotoxic cytotoxic cerebral edema seen after stroke there you use manitol but for vasogenic cerebral edema i will be giving steroids for these patients and then i'll be also using heparin now your query will be sir heparin is used in pulmonary thromboembolism when there are clots here there are no clots you are yourself saying there is fat globules and you are giving heparin well my dear friends heparin i agree to the fact contributes to antithrombotic effect you know antithrombin 3 activity is upgraded so it neutralizes the development of chances of a clot but if you read pharmacological books they also say a very interesting fact that heparin has a anti lipemic effect so it is going to dissolve the fat globules looks a little far fetched but true heparin not only has a anti thrombotic effect but it also has a anti lipemic effect and because fat globules are the villain in this case so we need to handle them by using heparin it could be plain heparin or uh, it could be a subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin shot once a day for convenience purposes we also need to prevent deep vein thrombosis in these patients because anyway they will not be allowed to move and if somebody is already having a fat embolism syndrome and god forbid if it develops dvt and then the clot embolizes to the lungs it's a double double insult so i want to prevent uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis by using compression stockings over the legs of the patient but at the same time i also want to say that uh, since he is having fracture of the lower extremity so this may not be possible in some cases like in case of polytrauma there might be trauma to both the tibia and both the both the femur of the patient in those circumstances i mean this approach point number 5 may not be feasible as well and then the chances of dvt will dr dramatically increase though i'm trying to reduce that by using heparin in the patient uh, also these patients because of their medical illness will be uh, predisposed to stress gi bleeding so pantoprazole would be routinely prescribed to these patients intravenously uh, this would minimize the chances so good supportive care good nursing care can definitely ensure some chances of survival for these patients and as far as the mortality of this condition is concerned yes the mortality is substantially high goes up excess of 50% but that depends upon how early and how late it was identified and also whether supportive medical care was provided to the patient or not but if we are able to identify early if we are able to manage 
we have seen cases where the patient was able to pull through this uh, i would say catastrophic phenomenon and was able to come out of the mayhem one of the important differential diagnoses i again want to highlight for this patient would be pulmonary thromboembolism and the second why i mentioned was pulmonary contusion and the third differential diagnosis for this i can say simply that uh, you see because the patient is comatose any comatose patient can develop aspiration pneumonia but then at the same time aspiration pneumonia is unlikely to be having petechiae aspiration pneumonia can definitely be contributing to development of uh, uh, damage to lungs so hypoxia will also contribute to cns manifestation so they have to be kept in mind you need to keep a open mind for this and one more disease i'll write before you where you are having a combination of lung findings as well as cns findings lung findings respiratory distress cs finding coma this disease has been discussed by me in the kidney topic thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura in this thrombos thrombocytopenic purpura the cns manifestation is in development of acute ischemic stroke so do read up the ttp diagnosis as well the list that i made before you is differential diagnosis of fat embolism syndrome i repeat the fact once again fat embolism has cns issues as well as lung issues a disease which can be having both cns and lung issues is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and the subsequent ones that i've written in these conditions like pulmonary thrombosis embolism and pulmonary contusion the hypoxia of the lung disease can also contribute to altered uh, cns mentation and similarly aspiration pneumonia the patient was uh, let me say comatose because of some uh, brain tumor and then he aspirated so anyway i mean the combination of two findings would still be present but uh, that obviously can be ruled out by taking proper history of the patient and deployment of the gerd criteria and fat embolism is uh, anyway uh, as i highlighted a catastrophic event i have seen uh, doctors fumbling for words in front of relatives in fact i myself would be fumbling for words to explain why there is a sudden deterioration because they don't understand and the technical stuff and that is the reason why lots of time you know the violence component occurs that the relatives will say surgery was not done properly it's not that any surgeon will uh, do some negligence during surgery that subsequently fat embolism will occur if it has to occur it will occur i told you the figures also figures can be as much as 90% it is just that the patient's body is able to handle the stress and if it's not able to handle stress then obviously uh, in 2% cases the fat embolism syndrome will occur where the mortality rate is substantially high as compared to other medical diseases so anyway a good uh, input and awareness of the disease has to be kept so that you are able to solve the questions uh, and are able to evaluate the history component properly uh, thank you so much for hearing me out and keep on working keep hammering guys and you'll be able to achieve your dreams